right, welcome back to the Grand Solar Minimum. Today is Thursday, June 28th, 2018. Thank you for tuning in to our uh, late evening edition. Let's get started with some space weather news. Get right to it over at spaceweather.com. Our solar wind speeds are hovering at 506 even kilometers per second with a density of 5.6. Wow. Almost forgot what this looked like. Uh, after about three weeks or so of constant solar activity with sunspot regions, we are now sitting at zero for the first time. And that is now 88 days on the year for 2018, as we expect some very, very quiet uh, conditions on our sun. Take a look at our KP indices, uh, sitting at a one right now with a 24 hour max of a two. And the SDO looks like it does have a couple of coronal holes that they are watching. Uh, right now, the reason why we are experiencing the uh, increase of solar wind is that we are in the solar stream of this, um, this coronal hole. As it is already turned away from Earth, uh, we should be coming down from that. Actually, we have been dropping throughout the afternoon into the evening hours. And really looking at the SDO in motion right now, um, we have a pretty quiet sun, and that's what we expect uh, during this time. But after many, many uh, days of solar activity across the sun, um, looking around to the eastern bend as well, we don't see uh, not even the slight amount of activity from the corona so uh, we could be looking at a few weeks of uh, spotless days now a friend of mine uh, told me this morning he's calling it uh, at least two weeks maybe three weeks of uh, spotless activity so um, and at this point I would have to agree with him and taking a look at our TSI readings right now for June 21st 2018 the last reading that we received was a 1360.6496. Now that's dropped a full 0 0.10. And I know you're thinking, woo, big deal. But uh, when you're watching TSI creep up and down as it does, uh, the value of 0 0.10 is kind of uh, a little bit more than usual, but nothing to be alarmed about, but just a significant little drop, if anything. And I saw this study, and thanks to spaceweather.com, they're the ones that alerted me to this paper, uh, this new paper that's out. If you go to spaceweather.com, I'll show you real quick where it's at. Uh, let's zoom back out of this real fast. All right, so that's awesome, by the way. We got noctilucent clouds and auroras. It's almost like they're fighting in the sky. But uh, over here, the article is here, flight attendants at higher risk of cancer. And then where you see the word here, you click on that and it will take you to this uh, paper as soon as I find it here. All right, here we go. So it says cancer prevalence among flight attendants compared to the general population. And I'll go ahead and read a little bit about this. Here is the abstract. The background part of this is the flight attendants are an understudied occupational group despite ongoing a wide range a wide range of adverse job related exposures including the known carcinogens in our study we aim to characterize the prevalence of cancer diagnosis among US cabin crew relative to the general population it says here for the methods section in 2014 through 2015 they surveyed participants of the Harvard flight attendant health study they compared the prevalence of their self-reported cancer diagnosis to a contemporary uh, cohort in the National Health and Nutrition Examined Survey, uh, 2013 through 14 is when it's established, I assume here, using age-weighted standardized prevalence ratios. Uh, we also analyzed associations between job tenure and the prevalence of selected cancers using logistic regression and adjusting for potential co-founders. Uh, it goes on to give the results here, the stats and everything, and then the conclusion they came up with was we observe higher rates of specific cancers and flight attendants compared to the general population, some of which were related to job tenure. Our results should be interpreted in light of self-reported uh, health information and cross-sectional study design. <clears throat> 
Future longitudinal studies should evaluate association between specific exposures and cancers among cabin crew. Um, we've talked about this before. This study goes into the um, background of cosmic rays and what happens when your body's exposed to it. Uh, right here in the, um, the article here, the researchers led by Irina um, Mordukov. Uh, sorry about that. I definitely butchered that last name. But she's out of um, Harvard University and listed uh, cosmic rays, irregular sleep habits, and chemical contaminants as likely risk factors. So the first thing that they named off um, from the person who led this research was cosmic rays. And we've talked about this before. I think Mari and I actually might have been in an interview at one point. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and we had uh, been talking about where we had read an article about they're testing out um, these water-like sacks to line the inner walls of the uh, cabins. And what these water sacks are doing, they are absorbing some of the cosmic ray uh, radiation. So... This is an interesting study that there actually is a real study out there that shows a link in uh, increased uh, chances for cancer. And one of the cancers, or two of the big cancers they mentioned really, uh, breast cancer, cervical cancer, and they did mention melanoma. So those were the three, uh, those were the three cancers that were uh, most common in the study. All right, I'll leave the link in the description for that. You guys can take a look at that study. Uh, very good paper. Uh, very interesting. It's educational for sure. It helps us understand a little bit more about what's going on uh, in, in those types of conditions to the human body. And we've talked about this in the past too. You, know, you can only imagine if flight attendants are at risk for these cancers and they're increasing, what's it going to do to our astronauts as we go into deep space into the future? So just keep our eyes on that. Quote of the week, Hansen, father of global warming, calls renewables grotesque idea. Uh, Anthony Watts points out here with this article that he wrote, by the way, this is out of um, the Boston Globe. And if you guys want to see that article, I put that link in the description. Here is the actual article itself. Uh, but he wanted to go ahead and highlight the very beginning of this. And it goes 30 years ago, while the midst of withered and massive drought in the East Coast temperatures exceeded 100 degrees Fahrenheit, I testified to the Senate as a senior NASA scientist about climate change. I said the ongoing global warming was outside the range of natural variability, and it could be attributed with high confidence to human activity, mainly from the spewing of carbon dioxide and other heat trapping gases into the atmosphere. <laughs> Okay, it's time to stop waffling so much and say the evidence is pretty strong that the greenhouse effect is here. You're absolutely correct. Now, Mr. Hansen is speaking the truth. We are seeing the greenhouse effect right now. Absolutely. I don't know about you guys, but I have seen plant life exploding this year. Rose bushes, uh, weeds, just mo huge, just bigger than what I've used to see them last year. Let's, let's put it that way definitely seen an increase of plant life so you're absolutely right uh the greenhouse effect is here we are seeing in regions that are allowing growth we are seeing explosions of vegetation right now so thank you james hansen i i know what would you do without me pointing out that you actually said the truth about something oh but he was referring to it being warm again i guess but you know you could spin it that way this clear and strong message about the dangers of carbon emissions was heard. The next day, it led the front pages of newspapers across the country. Climate theory led to political action with remarkable speed. Within four years, almost all nations, including the United States, signed a framework convention in De Rio de Janeiro, agreeing that the world must avoid dangerous human-made interference with the climate. Now, sadly, the principal follow-ups to the Rio were preparatory, uh, a Kodo protocol and Paris agreement type thing, wishful thinking, hoping that the countries will make plans to reduce emissions and carry them out. In reality, most countries follow their self-interest in global carbon emissions, continue to climb. See graph below, he says. 
It's not rocket science. As long as fossil fuels are cheap, they will be burned and emissions will be high. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I've uh, experienced $3 a gallon in gas since Memorial Day weekend. I wouldn't necessarily call fossil fuels particularly cheap right now. Uh, Diesel fuel is higher than regular unleaded. I remember a time where diesel fuel was $2 less on the gallon. Um, We have seen a 40% increase in our gas bill just from this winter. And I promise you, next winter, we're going to see probably up to 60 to 65% increase in the gas bill next year. Not because of use, but because of price. What we're being charged to burn these fossil fuels. So, you know, I'm glad that Anthony Watts caught this article today. And I'm glad that this idiot, James Hansen, wrote this article. Because he's really showing his ignorance here by saying it's not rocket science. As long as fossil fuels are cheap, they will be burned and emissions will be high. And I don't understand where this guy thinks that fossil fuels right now are cheap. Uh, Electrical uh, power plants this winter had to get fired up by coal plants. So there's another increase. We, we, the demand and supply thing did not work out too well this year. And my other fear is for the 2018 and 2019 winter to become as cold as it was this year in fact maybe not in the same exact regions but maybe this year we get oh let's say northeast you'll you'll see your fair share of 20s and teens for highs but maybe it's the midwest that gets the the deep cold this year you know i'm just saying i'm wondering what parts of the country we're going to see this year get that extreme cold weather i'll be shocked if it is the northeast again uh, just because of how up and down everything is right now so far we're entering the grand solar minimum and things are really um all over the place there's no consistent patterns right now it's up and down and you know i used to think that there was a way to kind of guess like on certain charts when they were coming out like for instance dr roy spencer uh very soon it's like christmas on the first of the month for me every month but you know i used to be able to think that i could guess all it's going to go up it's going to go down. It's October. It's going to be cooler. You know, it's, it's June. It's going to be warmer. And that's not happening. Um, so, you know, this guy, when he says it's not rocket science and then makes a statement like this, claiming that, and then, and then he wants to talk about, uh, you know, we have to have carbon fees. We got, this is, you know, economists agree 100% of this fee is distributed uniformly to the public. The economy will be spurred and the GMP will rise and millions of jobs will be created off of this carbon fee. Now that's what they're saying. So then he gets all the way down here to the bottom and blah, 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 blah. talks about how people supported Obama and that's just great and all that stuff. But then there is this weird um, part of the article that just made me, it, it was a head scratcher and forgive me. It took me a minute to find this because uh, Anthony Watts also pointed this out and really thought that this was interesting for him to say something again. I think, I don't think these people really understand what they're talking about. Um, especially when you see, uh, these ideas of, uh, carbon fees telling us that, um, oh, here we go. Saying that that fossil fuels are, um, you know, affordable right now. But he says this. This is what Hansen says. The notion that renewable energies and batteries alone will provide all energy is fanatical. It is also a grotesque idea because of the staggering environmental pollution from mining and material disposal. Uh, If all energy was derived from renewables and batteries, worse, tricking the public to accept the fantasy of 100% renewable means that, in reality, fossil fuels reign and climate change grows. Uh, I don't know what to say about this guy, this this Hanson guy. I've only become aware of him recently because of we've been approaching this 30-year birthday of this hoax, this 
this is worse than uh, that Nibiru stuff right here. Uh, it, it's, it's starting to look like that to me. Uh, the more we look into the science or the so-called science that the global warming crowd wants to stick with, it, I, I mean, this stuff is the kind of stuff that you can buy in the sci-fi section in the Amazon books. These guys don't make any sense. And they're double talking. It's not rocket science. As long as fossil fuels are cheap, they will be burned and emissions will be high. Fossil fuel use will decline only if the price is made to include cost of pollution and climate change to society. The simplest and most effective way to do this is collecting a rising carbon fee from fossil fuel companies. So basically, James's idea is just to raise the prices even more. That way you guys won't buy them. That'll solve it all. The CO2 will stop and everything will just go back to normal, right? Except for the fact that you keep saying that the CO2 is what warms. And that's not what NASA is saying now. NASA's changed their tune big time. Uh, NASA is saying that the only effect that they're going to confirm right now is greening. That there might have been a consensus on warming and trapped uh, warming, you know, in these warm greenhouse effects. But now NASA is saying for certainty, hey, it's, it's definitely greening things, but warming, no. And since then, we have seen President Trump cut funding to NASA for their CO2 monitoring program. And now we're seeing President Trump trying to take the focus of the climate away from NOAA and just let them stick with studying oceans and atmospheric conditions. I think that's a great idea. And these aren't coincidences, folks. It's a clear sign that this administration acknowledges that this carbon tax and this fee stuff and everything, this emissions causing the problems and not the sun and, and not these, uh, not these cycles. I was reading something the other day about, um, the temperatures in the oceans right now and how our oceans go through cycles that ha that are basically like a smoothing mechanism for the reaction from the sun for the climate. And right now the oceans are, preparing for the the cooler temperatures from the sun and that's why we're seeing these record high or record low temperatures coming out of the atlantic oceans off of africa sure we're seeing a little bit of rise in certain areas they should be going up right now but we're still looking at record low temperatures for parts of the north atlantic and in the mdr as well and, and i'll go ahead and show those later but Again, I'll leave the links in the description. You guys can go ahead and check those out. But I kind of wanted to start the show off on this stuff just because, you know, um, Hanson's a weirdo, I think, now for sure, uh, big time. And also, just to throw at you guys real quick, check this out. Uh, 254 scientific papers have been published that cast doubt on the position that uh, human CO2 emissions function as the climate's fundamental control knob basically they're saying here uh consensus science got smashed in 2018 and he's right we're looking at six months into the year and there are 254 new papers just in six months of, and here are the links check this out guys this isn't just a bunch of words I don't know if anything gets excluded when it comes to the graphs, the locations, what we're measuring, what we're looking at, links to other studies that go to these. So we have 254 papers that are a lot like this that are showing the cooling trend. Oh, look at this. Eastern U.S. cooling from 1961 through 2015 appears that's still continuing here we have another chart that has a downward trend starting here closer to the well right now we see the we had our brief period of warming from the 80s into early 2000 
and then now here we are on the decline links gonna be in the description I highly recommend everyone who is a skeptic of what we're trying to educate really I want you guys to look at this stuff I want you guys to take a good look at this and you're not gonna be able to do it in a couple days there's 254 of these papers um, tons of information all pointing towards man-made global warming is bull and the quicker we all accept that and start looking at real scientific information the quicker we can move on to solutions on a global scale and not just individual communities who choose to listen to the, to the science and the facts that choose to try to learn and study what's happening right now versus the people who have it all figured out and Al Gore is telling the truth and because of global warming you know we're screwed we're over the tipping point I'm sick of hearing that we're not over any tipping point the tipping point is not here yet trust me on that and we go to new eruption of Mount Agung disrupts air travel now this has been going on for most of the day uh, started on June 27th, 2018. Uh, I was speaking with Rob earlier today. We were seeing ash plumes as high as, uh, well, it says here we got up to 16,000 feet above sea level. Uh, I know I was alerted to this eruption as early as uh, mid morning. So this has been going on pretty much all day today. And here's a few images from Twitter on this. Not the first time we've reported on a gung. It's been active off and on now for quite some time. We'll keep an uh, eye on this. Right now it's at a alert level 3 out of a 4. So it is affecting air travel as we speak. And an intense eruption starts at Sierra Negra. Volcano here in Ecuador. New eruption started at Sierra Negra Volcano at around 1340 UTC. I'm sorry, that's local time, 2140 UTC time. At least 50 people living close to the Sierra Negra Volcano on the Isabella Island have been evacuated after a series of earthquakes on June 26 that resulted in one of the worst eruptions of this volcano known to history. Lava flows are being observed on the northern flanks of the volcano directed towards the interior of the cauldra and another part towards the northern flank of the direction of Baja Elizabeth. Uh, that's the IGEPN reported 2236 UTC time on June 26. This eruption is producing a cloud of gas and ash which is moving to the west of the volcano. Let's see if I can play a few seconds of this without getting in trouble. So far so good, right? <clears throat> ah, sorry guys I haven't gone through the video This I didn't know it was going to be this this fella here just talking the whole time I was hoping to see some footage but we don't have it available right now but uh, that's pretty intense looking kind of reminds you of Kilauea a little bit we'll keep an eye on this one that's just a little uh, two today nope make that three alerts raised for Cleveland Volcano after def detection of small lava flow this is in Alaska satellite observations of Cleveland volcano on June 25th 2018 indicate the presence of small circular lava flow about 80 meters in diameter covering the floor of the summit crater uh, that's according to the Alaskan volcano observatory reported on June 26 geophysical monitoring data from Cleveland volcano has been unavailable since early afternoon June 25th and thus it is unknown if the infusion of lava within the crater generated detectable seismicity or infrasound. However, the presence of lava flow over the active vent incre increases the possibility of vent clearing explosion over the coming days to weeks, and thus AVO raised the aviation code color and volcano alert level to orange, which is a watch. Occasional short duration explosive activity with a minimal to no precursory signals is common at the volcano and adding that explosions may occur without warning. 
Explosions at Cleveland typically produce relatively small volcanic ash clouds that dissipate within hours. However, more significant ash emissions may occur as they have in the past. Cleveland Volcano is monitored by one, on one of two seismic stations, which restricts AVO's ability to detect precursory unrest that may lead to an explosion or eruption. So that's three to report on today and nothing huge, but just pretty active when it comes to our volcanoes today. And these are ones that we've reported on in the past as well. Destructive flash floods hit part of parts of Greece. One of the worst hit areas of the town of Mandra, the seat of Mandra Elida municipality where 24 people have died. And this was back, uh, after a similar flash flood hit in November of 2017, there are no reports of injuries, but structural damage is, is very high. Around 30 homes were flooded and local roads submerged in the area of Canalia after stems, or I'm sorry, streams broke their banks and reports of firefighters were on duty in a broader area and responded to scores of uh, calls to pump out flooded basements or reduce stranded motorists. Wow. So the firefighters come over and pump out your basement. And here I've been doing it all myself this whole time. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, a little bit of uh, flood humor for me. Every time it rains a half inch. To today. today, last week, the week before. I mean, uh, it's been bad. Ever since we had the ice jam floods, we have seen um, some flooding in our basement just about every time we get a significant amount of rain in a short period of time. Now, we're not looking at rain like this. Uh, by any means, am I implying that? But uh, So I can't really relate to this kind of flash flooding. This is just, wow. That's all I'm going to say. Speaking of that, I want to show you guys something real quick. And we've seen many, 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 like this guy right here. That's a car that's protected by blankets. And it's not the only one. There was other cars down the street. Now this looks like little hail, but these folks have seen some insane hail storms over here in Turkey. And Mari and I had both seen these pictures earlier today and shout out to uh, severe weather Europe on Facebook. And we thought it was, well, not funny, but unfortunate that these folks were taking it to this extreme and bear with me here, guys. I wanted to show you some of the hail. This is also in Turkey. Flash floods here. I mean, those are some pretty fast-moving waters. And here's more hail in Spain. This was today. Look at that. Thanks to these guys, we get to see this. Here's more hail. This is Istanbul, uh, Turkey, June 27th. Don't seem that all bad, but they've had some serious hail in the past. Look at this. This is what they were doing to protect themselves from the hail. Apparently, the insurance on that's not very good. Wow. Those look like aluminum panels. So they weren't messing around. Some folks uh, maybe had just gotten their cars or vehicles repaired from the last hailstorm and didn't want to repeat. So that's some serious hail. All right. And we shift gears back to the U.S. Uh, out here in Kansas. Destructive tornado hits Eureka. Five people injured. State of disaster declared in Kansas. And here we go. In Kansas, Jeff Governor Jeff Kohler declared a state of disaster in Glenwood County after a destructive tornado swept through a small town of Eureka, population 2450. A tornado warning was issued at 1919 Central Daylight Time. The tornado struck just two minutes at later, leaving residents little time to take shelter. Wow, not even like the three to ten minutes that they are trying to get you. They couldn't even get on that one. An initial assessment found damage to more than 100 city blocks an extensive uh, tree damage. At least five people were injured. One of them critically, the police had said. About 5,700 have lost power. And as of this morning, the uh, 1718 still remain without power. 
lots of uh, damage uh, assessments to still be done. Let's see if we can get anything out of this. This just looks like an aerial view of the damage, but it does appear to be nighttime. So I doubt we're going to see anything. Yeah. Nothing too clear on that one. It's late. So hopefully we'll get an update on this tomorrow and get some more images from that area. This is old news. Um, this was from yesterday, but I, you know, we had a different kind of uh, show, and I didn't really do a lot of article uh, to speak of. But we're still talking about snow and record-breaking summer snow. Snow fell on parts of Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada on Monday, June 26, and authorities warned residents there was a risk of snow and frost into Tuesday, both on the island and the big land. According to Environment Canada, EC, the temperature was hovering around freezing in some areas, and the snowfall set a record for June 26 in Gander, where about 0.78 inches of snow had fallen by mid-morning. Not that much, but snowfall has never fallen previously on this day. We'll be in the record books but for that, and, you know, as minor as that is, but, but we are not complete strangers to late season snowfalls. 1.25 inches fell in Gander on June 20th, 1996, and 0.07 fell in 1950, I'm sorry, on June 30th, 1995, so very light um, accumulations, but still uh, almost an inch on June 26. They beat their old record, which was the latest they'd had accumulating snow was 1996 with 1.25 inches. Um, so pretty amazing stuff here. Talking about some of the temperatures and where we were with that as well on Tuesday. The temperature in Gander on Tuesday was only forecasted to reach 3 degrees Celsius, which is 37.4 which would break another record. The previous cold is June 26 was 4.4, which is 39.9 degrees. So it broke it slightly, just by a couple degrees. The average normal temperature around 19 Celsius, guys. The high was 32 Celsius. That's how, okay. So we're supposed to be at, at uh, 19 and we're looking at temperatures in the low single digits Celsius. You know, uh, I'm not saying it's supposed to be blistering hot. Obviously, the average is only 66, but that's a lot warmer than uh, 34 degrees. I'm sorry, 37 degrees on June 26. But this is a sign of things to come. We're starting to see the warning signs from Mother Nature already. That's why we share these articles. That's why there's channels like us out here that talk about this stuff to prepare people to get them ready. Arctic Ocean, almost totally ice covered. Uh, I brought this up because I had a, a, a I'm not going to call him names because he just doesn't know better, obviously, but he left a comment on a video that we did not too long ago. We were talking about the thickness of sea ice in the Arctic. Um, and he had left a comment saying, I, I don't know any kind of ice map that shows red as a, a bad thing, you know, red means heat, you know? So he's trying to say that what we're looking at right here is we're looking at temperatures on the North. And he thinks that in this red and yellow areas here, that this is warm weather or something. And this is all, you know, mildly cold and only the deep cold is over here. And well, Robert Felix, maybe he saw that comment too. Maybe he was in our comment section, but I, I appreciate he broke it down says purple uh, signifies sea ice thickness approximately of a half to one and a half meters, which is 20 inches to five feet. The blue green signifies anywhere from five feet to 10 feet. Yellow to orange signifies 10 to 13 feet and red signifies 13 to 16 feet. So Leslie, uh, my man, I hope you're watching because they just broke it down for you. Um, the red is the thickest kind of ice to have. Read that. It says here, 13 to 16 feet in the red areas. So I just wanted to bring that up from one of our, uh, I don't know if he's a subscriber or maybe just a wise ass, but uh, yes, this is how they show the sea ice thickness. These are the colors, and Mr. Felix has been kind enough to break it down for everyone to understand. Red signifies 13 to 16 feet 
of Ice. We'll leave the link in the description, Leslie. You can take a look at it, buddy. And we don't talk about just the cold here at the Grand Solar Minimum. We are going to talk about the heat. Surging heat and humidity combined with light winds will create dangerous heat wave in the northeastern United States, which is forecast to be at its peak this weekend into early next week. Uh, however, even during after Independence Day, hot and humid weather will roll on. And that is also the truth from what I've looked at. People who live for hot weather will be pleased, while some senior citizens, younger children, folks with respiratory ailments, and those who must do manual labor will may be especially at risk. You know, I'm not an old senior citizen, children, folk with respiratory ailments, or, but I don't like to be on this heat either. So, yeah, I bet you are, Mari. Daytime temperatures will surge into the 90s Fahrenheit here in America. And uh, AccuWeather real, Accu real field temperatures are predicted to top 100 in the northeastern United States during the afternoon hours on Sunday through, I'm sorry, Saturday through Monday. Here we are Saturday, and where I live, looky here, we are going to be in the 100 to 105 index. Not good. Uh, you folks from southwest Ohio, my family and friends in Dayton, looks like you guys will be pushing the 105 to 110 real feel mark on Saturday. And then it gets worse. Uh, we go into Sunday, and it gets really hot. Uh, in fact, Buffalo is flirting with an all-time record high of 100 degrees on Sunday. And not only is it an all-time record high, but... I don't think, and somebody will probably correct me, but I'm pretty sure I read that Buffalo has never hit the 100 degree mark. So this would be historic, historic heat. But I hate to toot my own horn. I'm going to have to. I And I know other people in this community have said this too. We, we were going to see heat waves this year. We didn't really see it last year. I did say it. I'm just saying and so have other people in this community. This heat wave, to me, does not represent that, oh, the minimum's not coming. No. This stuff happens. And this extreme heat is happening because of what's going on in our oceans right now. Leave the link in the description. I already showed you guys that article. I guess I wanted to show it to you again. Please check this out, guys. Like I said, 254 papers. Can't go wrong. Here's a look at our current radar. Actually, let's make it really current. This was current a half hour ago. I've been babbling. The joys of live. Here we go. Zooming in a little bit on the far southern region here in Alabama and Georgia. You guys look a little active with some thunderstorm action that's moving from north to south. So pushing off to the Gulf of Mexico is where we can expect your weather to go. And let's go ahead and take a look here in the Midwest as well. Uh, you guys have seen some pretty, again, storm system is moving from north to south. Uh, Southern Illinois is getting a very, very big dose of heavy rain. Uh, I would not be surprised to, uh, there could be some, uh, flash flooding from these storms, but they're moving pretty quick. So that's the good news. And I think that's, well, let's, you know, let's take a look here in Montana. We're seeing some shower action here in Montana and North Dakota. And we'll take a quick look at that. Heavy showers and rain moving to the Canadian border. So watch out up above, A. Eh? And take a look at Windy. Again, nothing really significant to happen as far as uh, any kind of hurricane action or major uh, low pressure systems that we see. Um, it does, however, show thunderstorms return to the northern plains again in North Dakota, parts of Minnesota, and then those storms do invade uh, parts of Canada. And as we get into the weekend, that heat builds in in the east, and you could even see it on the moisture jet stream how we are protected from any kind of moisture from this high-pressure heat dome that's taking over here in the northeast. And by Monday... The, the Midwest may get a little bit of minor relief, but we look like we've got a little bit of development going on here in the Gulf. Uh, check it out here on Sunday. We start to see a disturbance here around Florida, and then it just kind of blossoms right before our eyes. 
Let's see if I can uh, show you guys here. I know it's on the very, very, very southern tip here, but I'll move it just a little bit more. And this is going into Sunday afternoon, into the evening. It doesn't look too organized. It looks like it fades away. And then by, let's say, early Monday morning, look at that. More development. So it almost disappears through overnight hours. The sun, imagine that, takes away its energy. And during the day on Monday, it kind of reforms. Let me move this out of your way. I'm sure you guys know where that's at now. And kind of goes into Louisiana, Gulf of Mexico area, intense rain, rakes the coast, intensifies through Tuesday of next week, finally trying to make landfall by Wednesday but still raking the coast, not really moving too much north, south, but a whole lot of east and west. And finally, by Wednesday, Thursday, it does move pretty far inland. But again, as it treks across uh, parts of Texas into Mexico by Thursday, it kind of holds together pretty well. So hopefully Texas will get uh, some necessary rainfall from this and not uh, nothing dangerous from this situation. But as we go into late week next week, and into the weekend, it's quiet. Uh, in fact, it's real quiet. Now, this is the European model. They are showing light showers in the Midwest and parts of the Northeast, so nothing major, but uh, nothing really to write home about. That's for sure. And we'll look at the GFS run real quick and see what we have past uh, what uh, the European model runs to on next Friday. And right now, we are at Monday of next week. And really, just a bunch of scattered chances for rain. Now, they show that storm also on GFS, and it does move westward into Texas later on. And then here's the extended forecast into mid-July, and GFS is, is being bullish when it comes to moisture in the south and the northeast and the midwest. Um, it looks like that after we get this heat wave here, that's going to last into the 1st of July towards the middle of the 5th and to the 6th, and then we start to see some more widespread chances of July on the 7th of July into the 8th and 9th and 10th as it continues to be a steady stream of moisture flow throughout the week late next week and the week after that as well. So it's been a rainy pattern most of the summer. Uh, I'm going to have to get some data together that shows how much exactly we've seen. Uh, I, I wonder how many cities and states are looking at above average if not record-breaking precipitation totals i know we've got extreme uh, droughts going on in texas and oklahoma new mexico nevada uh, arizona uh, parts of colorado uh, even parts of uh, kansas uh, nebraska some parts uh, mostly in that southwest region and some moderate uh, dryness going on in the northeast as well believe it or not so keeping our eyes on that and i wanted to show you guys the anomaly temperatures real fast the east tropical atlantic did have a slight rise to 1.3 below baseline again negative same here with the caribbean it has fallen i thought it was going to be on the rise to pass the baseline again has dropped to a negative point uh 636 and then we have our values here on the atlantic mdr didn't really change much it stayed on the bottom at point uh, or zero negative 0.974 so almost a full degree under baseline and the north atlantic at its new low um it's 0.782 uh, below baseline so that's going to be our report for today mari i'd like to check in with you real quick before we uh, take off how's everything going tonight let me get the mic here oh, i'm just knocking stuff over things are great we have a lot of uh, people in here. A lot of the mods are in here. You got people like Steelers Saints Cardinals in here, Jake. I'm not going to tell you. He's making fun of you, but that's his job as a mod to make fun of you. And we got Rob and people are sharing some great information. Um, Anomalous Howard is going to be sharing some papers about cosmic rays and SO2 and all that stuff. So that's going to be sort of interesting. Uh, I just want to say hi to everyone in the chat. Hope you guys are having a great night. Uh, you guys are such a pleasure. And I love how you all share your information with what you're doing with your prepping and your little tips and tricks. 
you guys are great so that's all I gotta say Jake I'm gonna pass this mic back to you all right and a bit of a programming note Henrik will be with us uh, and I haven't even told him this but hopefully he's okay with it but um, due to schedule constraints on Friday it'll be easier for us to do this again on Saturday so let's hope that he's available Look forward to seeing Henrik on the show on Saturday at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Friday, if we do a show, it will be in the afternoon. Um, and, but once again, the show with Henrik is still on. We're just going to move it to Saturday like we did last week. And we have lots to talk about. Henrik has a few things that he would like to speak on, and they are very important as well. So looking forward to that on Saturday at 6.30 but tomorrow is going to be an afternoon show if it does happen. I say if because you just never know these days. All right, guys, that's going to do it for us tonight. Thank you for tuning in and watching. Please like and subscribe. We'll talk soon.